Okay, we'll we'll make a start. Um, thank you, everyone, for for joining the uh, concluding um, keynote of this year's Advances for Field Experiment Conference. We are very excited and happy to have Rubike given today's uh, last keynote. Rubike Malandia is the Edward J. and Molly Arnold Professor of Finance at Berkeley Hess and a Professor of Economics at Berkeley as well. Uh, she's been at Berkeley since two thousand and six. And her research is in a lot of different exciting areas, such as corporate finance, behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and the economics of organizations. Um, I think all of us today have read at least a, one of Ubrick's papers. Uh, mine was in grad school on paying not to go to the gym, that, just because that really did hit home for me. But Ubrick's work is, you know, especially in the behavioral side, is trying to unpack some of the mechanisms as to why sometimes we have overconfidence, sometimes we have self-control problems, and how do we engage in markets to overcome those two things. But also, she's expanded the work on using field experiments in areas such as charitable giving, uh, voting behavior, and again, trying to use theory and the experiments to close down different mechanisms. Is it altruism? Is it social pressure and so forth? So we're really happy to have Rika given today's talk. And um, you know, some of her recent work has been thinking about you know, how do the field experiments actually inform theory? And what selection do we get into experiments? And how does that selection help or hinder the work that you want to do? So Rika, thank you so much for being here and over to you. Well, thank you so much for the super kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and give the concluding speech. Congratulations to the organizers for a really interesting conference as well. And um, as um, Rob already alluded to, my talk today will not be about a field experiment or some of my a field experimental work, but um, uh, a kind of a little bit of a meta level talk about some of my recent work um, on experience based learning, which I hope will lend itself to um, field experiments and field experimental ideas. Um, people in the audience are much better equipped to think about than I am. So the title is uh, Exposure, Experience and Expertise. I like uh, alliterations. Uh, why personal histories matter for economic decisions. And to give the punchline just right ahead, um, um, the insight I've been working with and, and wrestling with in, in lots of my recent research is that um, um, I found that personal experiences we've lived through in our lives so far exert an immense lasting impact on our beliefs, on our risk attitudes, on our decision making, which isn't well captured in much of the existing models, whether they are on the traditional neoclassical side or the behavioral side. Um, to illustrate what I have in mind with um, something you know, very recent, something we're all living through right now, let's think about the example uh, of the current COVID-19 pandemic and life at quarantine, and let's ask how, how will that affect us? How will that affect, for example, our financial decision-making? Now, if you read um, the news about this, there are two channels that are on everybody's mind. First, there's the immediate impact of being at home. As Rob alluded to, you know, I've thought about people going or not going to the gym and what incentives to set. Well, currently, many of us have no opportunity uh, to go to the gym, um, to not even to go to work. I'm giving this talk from home. And um, the question is how that, how, how the lack of uh, interactions at work, at the gym, in stores, and the shift of behavior, for example, more online shopping, um, will af uh, affect our decision making. For example, in the financial realm, you know, the, the, the Wall Street Journal recently um, had this article that everybody is a day trader now. You see Robin Hood trending on Twitter. So that's one immediate impact. Then we are thinking about the medium term impact and a lot of it revolves around the lasting effects of the COVID-19 crisis, for example, on our earnings, wealth accumulation, you know, maybe uh, we lost our jobs, um, there's uncertainty about future job prospects. As, as the director of graduate studies at the business school, I certainly have a lot of that uncertainty of job prospects I'm carrying with me right now um, about our future earnings, our kids' future earnings, etc. But what has been um, less on people's mind, at least initially, is how this experience may alter us in the long run. How the exposure to these different environments in our day-to-day -day life might have long-lasting implications 
even after the crisis, and how that might be relevant not only for the easily uh, distorted beliefs of some average consumer and individual investor, but maybe even for the experts, for the professionals. So to, to, to clarify what I mean here, let's do a little exercise in magical thinking. Let's assume, magically, we'll have a 100% effective, effective vaccine super soon, let's say by the end of the year. And moreover, after that, the health crisis has been fixed. Um, all of us have our jobs back, our job security back, our earnings are the same, earnings prospect, um, we professors are teaching our students in person again, and uh, impact on any other variable that shows up in standard models like wealth accumulation is minimal. Basically, in March 2021, we are magically back into the world of pre-COVID-19. So the question is, would we then be back to a world uh, with the same decision-making, for example, financial investment, as um, we were in uh, BC, as Claudia Golden put it, before, in the, before Corona era. Well, that's what the me of Pokios on short run and medium run implications would imply. That's what our models would imply. Yeah, I'm not saying that economists are arguing, oh, once we have a vaccine and so on, we will be back to the pre-corona area. But what I'm trying to convey here is that the way our usual models work, um, uh, the result would be of that type of thinking that if I were to uh, magically reestablish all the pre-corona conditions, then we would be back to the same decision-making, the same belief, belief formation, et cetera, et cetera. There's no room for us having changed and acting differently um, compared to before the crisis. And that's exactly the aspect of the whole body of economic models, frankly, whether on the standard neoclassical side or the more behavioral side, I'm wrestling here with. I think we need to change, it's important to change, and I hope to kind of in, engage more people to follow that path. The traditional models um, do not leave room for personally experienced outcomes to have any effect that's different from having read about those, from having information about these satanic parables, of course. So living through a depression, financial depression, the re uh, Great Recession, etc., will have no different impact on our decision making than knowing that these outcomes can happen and using that to update our beliefs. Again, controlling for all the usual variables like wealth, income, age, time effects, etc. And that's again exactly what models and evidence of experience effects channel. We argue in this research that personal experience has a lasting impact on behavior. And in terms of mechanism, the best word I found for it is not to think about it in terms of biased beliefs, although you may want to model it that way, but as a type, type of rewiring. And I will actually link it back later in the talk to um, the neuroscience evidence on synaptic tagging, which I think is the underlying uh, mechanism. But before I get to that, uh, let me just clarify one more time that with this type of new modeling and new empirical exercises we're engaging is we are a little bit disrupting the usual dichotomy between behavioral and neoclassical kind of distinctions. So, in many of my previous talks on, say, overconfidence and how that affects our decision making, um, self control problems, etc., I and you know, other behavioral researchers would try to draw this distinction between our neoclassical model, where we have um, each individual being a payoff maximizer, um, forming rational beliefs using base formula. Um, using his perfect or his or her perfect cognition um, to take all relevant information into account. So I think that's our traditional homo economicus. And so then our behavioral researchers came along and said, well, that's not quite right. Um, say from my research on um, charitable giving or voting behavior, I think there are other aspects um, we care about, other things we are maximizing. Um, and other influences that induce us to exhibit reciprocal behavior, altruistic behavior, etc. Moreover, or our beliefs are not necessarily rational. You know, we may see a pawn as a king, and um, 
and um, we might therefore distort the probabilities of certain outcomes. And finally, we most certainly don't have perfect cognition, but limited memory, uh, limited attention, etc. So homoeconomicos is not the model to work with. I don't quite know how we call the alternative, whether homo sapiens, the wise homo is really the right word, but that's kind of the psychological realism a behavioral economist try to introduce. Now, what models of experience-based learning are trying to do is kind of orthogonal to this debate. Whether you're working in an environment where the neoclassical model does a good job or whether you might need more psychological realism in terms of beliefs, preferences, and cognition, it's kind of irrespective to the dynamic realism, if you want, um, experience-based learning tries to introduce. So here the idea is, um, as you can see in this cartoon from the Great Depression, that we are you know, walking through life, all of a sudden an event hits us, um, I mean, in this case, with the Great Depression, and then that just alters us. Um, as the word experience says, um, some of you know how much I love ancient language, so languages, so the, the beautiful Latin deponents, experiri, actually comes from ire, walk, pair, through something, and then come out, ex, altered. Um, so that's where experience comes for, from. This is why I would maybe, you know, propose homo experience instead. And I do want to mention already here that actually the word expert comes also from experiencing. So our idea of an expert is somebody who has lived through uh, aspects of um, um, throughout his life, has seen things that um, alter that person and they come out differently. So let me give you, let me start from a famous example with which I actually started this research agenda um, nine years ago uh, with Stefan Nagel, which is the Great Depression. So the, here the idea was to kind of test whether people who lived through the Great Depression, the generation famously dubbed the Depression Babies here in the US, is indeed, has indeed been altered by this experience, by being exposed to headlines like the one you're seeing here, um, personally suffering losses, and as this quote says, uh, as a result, avoiding all things risky, in particular the stock market, but all things risky like the plague. And um, that's what, exactly what we found already in the raw data before, you know, I don't have time today to show you regression um, results for the various papers I'm going to be touching on. But if you just go to the raw data of stock market, preferences to invest in the stock market, and you look at people from their mid-30s to their mid-40s, uh, and you do that separately by different courts. So the first bar here on the left is the court born up to 1920, then you have 21 to 30, 31 to 40, et cetera, et cetera you do see that the participation, the, the, the likelihood of investing at least $1 in the stock market is significantly lower for the generation, the, the first bar, the generation that um, experienced the Great Depression as teenagers, young adults, than all other cohorts. You know, there's an upward trend, but they are at 13% compared to 26, 30 or higher percentages in the later generations. You see more stuff in this raw data graph. For example, you see the 31 to 40 cohort, the third bar here. Um, um, that's the generation of people who experienced the post-World War II boom as in their young adult life, and they have participation rates more than twice as high as, as our depression babies. Then it dips a little bit again, consistent with the fact that the cohort of 41 to 50 um, um, uh, people in their mid 30s, 40s had experienced um, the recession, depression years um, of the 1970s. And so in this early research, we show that indeed knowing what has happened to the stock market in a person's life so far gives you significant economically large predictive power in terms of um, is that person investing at all in the stock market? And if so, conditional on being a participant, what fraction of their liquid wealth do they invest in the stock market? That holds not only for the Great Depression, which I've been singling out initially, but we've basically been using data from, from the survey of consumer finance of the last century, more or less, um, where we find a persistent effect. Um, importantly, this um, seems to be relevant enough that it aggregates up to explain market movements. So here's a back of the envelope calculation from that earlier paper, where we basically, with these red bars, take from the US census, the whole US population, everybody's birth year, given their birth year, calculate their lifetime experience, roughly uh, linearly 
you know, an, an, an average of how the stock market did during their lives so far with some linearly declining weights or some recency bias. So we do that for every single person in the US and then average over all of the US with some weights depending on, on liquid wealth. And that gives you um, the red bars. And then we plot it against that in blue, the price earnings ratio. So when that's high, the market is, probably, is currently thinking very highly about um, the prospects of firms and, and future economic conditions, therefore for those firms, um, relative to fundamentals, relative to say the book value of their assets, for example. And you, know, you don't need to do many econometrically refined tests to see that lifetime experiences and market valuations in the aggregate are highly correlated. So if most people alive have mostly seen good stuff happen in the stock market, a lot of them are in the stock market and drive up valuations. And vice versa, after a prolonged period of downturn, uh, in particular, if say young people have seen nothing but a downturn, that's what they're gonna be weigh being weighing heavily. So that leads to decline in these red bars and it's co highly correlated with the price earnings ratios. Now, um, this kind of insight applies not only to stock market experiences and stock market investment, but to many, many markets we've looked at, at, at since then. One uh, which uh, Stefan and I, as both being Germans, uh, we had been particularly interested in was inflation. So Germans are famously very nervous about inflation, uh, maybe because we grew up with pictures like the ones you see here in our history textbooks, um, people playing with bundles of money, which are completely worthless during the German hyperinflation. Inflation. Um, and so the question is whether the attitudes and beliefs about fu future um, increases and decreases in prices might be explained by our historical experiences, no matter what monetary policy measures are like right now. And indeed, you don't have to go to Germany in the earliest 20th century. You can go to very recent or medium recent U.S. history, for example, during the peak of the U.S. inflation in the 70s and finally 1980, the then Fed chairman Paul Volcker was really worried whether he can convince people that he's going to get a handle on price stability again. Why was he so worried? Well, he's saying there's a whole gener an entire generation of young adults that has grown up since the mid-1960s knowing only inflation, nothing but increasing and increasing inflation. And he is wondering, can I ever convince them that we're going to get back to price stability? That's exactly, that's exactly the right worry is what we would be saying. Um, you can do whatever you want in terms of committing to official policies. They have lived through that period and that will be sticking to, uh, to them. And even these days at times of, you know, zero lower bound, um, you know, people have the related opposite worry, like Jay Powell worrying that um, as you see inflation moving down, expectations moving down, we, we kind of get on a road that it's very, very hard for economists to get off on. Once you're on it, once people are stuck in this belief, you can do whatever measure you want to, you don't get off. And so he doesn't want to get on that road. So let me translate that into some data, um, what these um, Fed chairmen have been saying. So here's data from the Michigan Survey of Consumers, which asks consumers whether they think um, prices will go up, down, or stay the same over the next year. And condition on saying up or down, they also ask, at least in slightly gray shaded areas, they ask them by how much. And so, you know, while people often have pretty crazy beliefs, the mean or median is doing pretty well. So the mean or median of the representative sample captures quite closely what will be exposed realized inflation. And so um, here, for example, for, you know, 1970s to 1980s, you see these beliefs go up, 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 consistent with what was actually happening. But that's not what I'm displaying. What I'm showing here is um, uh, separately, um, for people below 40, the young, 40 to 60, and above 60, how their statements, their beliefs about future uh, inflation deviates from the population mean. So I'm showing their answer minus what the average was in that year. Why am I doing that? I want to show um, not only the kind of average belief, but I want to zoom into the cross-sectional differences and the differences and differences over time. So what's so interesting and had long been ignored in, in macroeconomics, where so many models were fit to the you know, representative consumer, is that there's enormous discrepancies um, in beliefs. So for example, in 1980, you see that between the top 
black, uh, the below 40 young guys, and the bottom blue dot, the above 60 guys, you have about three percentage points. Three percentage points difference in beliefs on average across these two groups. So huge differences in beliefs. And moreover, it's not that the old are always kind of lower in the expectations than the young. You see over time, it goes back and forth. Sometimes the blue is on top, sometimes the black is on top, and it dips and gets closer over time. And these are huge movements. How can we explain them? Well, it turns out if you get for every of these survey respondents their birth year and you look up what inflation they've personally lived through, what price changes they've personally lived through in their life so far, you get enormous predictive power. So here on the next slide, I'm kind of showing you the fit of this experience-based learning model. It's roughly speaking the same as with the stock market. Take a person's birth year, take all the realizations of inflation, form the average with roughly linearly declining weight, some, some recency bias, therefore, and see what based on that their prediction of inflation would be. Controlling, I mean, of course, controlling for all sorts of um, uh, macro relevant variables, in including um, time effects. So this is about the cross-sectional um, heterogeneity. And you get, I mean, you, it's not perfect, but you get a lot of things. You get the reversal when the young are more pessimistic than the old, and when it reverses, when it's, the differences spike. And it's all very neatly explained by just saying, okay, the then 40-year-olds say in 1980, what have they seen in their life so far? Well, exactly as Walker said, they have seen inflation, increasing inflation, nothing but inflation. That's where they put the excess weight on, and this is how they come up with these exaggerated beliefs about future inflation. Well, the people above 60, you know, they're not excited necessarily about the inflation, but they've seen other times, and they don't overreact to it, they average it out. So experience-based learning gives you predictive power in terms of beliefs and decision-making in different markets and interestingly, differently so for different generations of consumers and investors. That's something that's, you know, behavioral models of over-extrapolation, et cetera, can't give you. Now, importantly um, to us, um, this is not just the case for the small individual investor, for the average consumer on the street who has no clue about inflation, might not even know what inflation is, something we've asked in, in, in surveys and some people aren't quite sure what inflation is. This is the case even for experts. Um, so in a related paper, again with Stefan, but also Zakian, um, we looked at FOMC members' beliefs about inflation. And before I show you some pictures about uh, the results, let me just go to my favorite example or anecdote, if you want. Um, one of the people in our sample uh, is Henry Wallach, born as Heinrich Wallich uh, in Berlin in 1914 into a family of bankers. They lived through the German uh, hyperinflation in 1923 and then ultimately emigrated to the US in the 1930s. The US, um, Heinrich Wallich or Henry Wallach had a successful career as an economist, ultimately became governor uh, on the Fed, set on the FOMC from 1974 to 1986. So this person, having lived through the German hyperinflation, dissented 27 times during his tenure on the board, which is still the highest number of dissents in Federal Reserve history uh, until today. And that was happening decades later, decades after he had emigrated from Germany, and after having gotten a fantastic education as an economist, uh, being very, very informed about inflation, you know, all the data was right there, and still uh, there's nice documentation about that. He kept saying that people don't understand how quickly inflation can happen, and, um, and that steps uh, against it have to be, have to be taken. Um, now, it's not only Henry Wallach um, where, we, where we detect a, a lifetime experience to matter that is, in fact, powerful for all Fed governors for the whole FOMC. So here's a graph where we went to the semi-annual monetary policy reports um, um, FOMC members uh, make to Congress, in which, among other things, they um, indicate what their belief is regarding inflation over, over the next year. And so what we are plotting here is the forecast of an FOMC member on the y-axis normalized by the staff green book. So they have this whole big staff pulling together all the data and giving them green book with their best estimate. So normalized by that, plotted against 
what the experience was or if the experience-based forecast, again, normalized by, by the staff forecast. And as before, in the other pictures I showed you, you don't need to run many regressions to see the strongly positive correlation. So in other words, what we're saying here is that in their stated beliefs about future inflation, um, we can use their personal lifetime experiences of inflation, depending on when they were born, where they were born, what inflation they've seen so far, and get strong predictive power uh, uh, in terms of how big of future inflation they're, uh, they're, they're predicting. And this is for people who, again, have, you know, all the inflation data and other relevant economic data at their fingertips, as far as I understand, plus a fantastic staff that puts together these green books, which, by the way, as my colleagues Christy and David Roma have shown before, typically do better than the actual, you know, F uh, FOMC member forecast. Um, so, so in some sense, this helps to explain why they deviate and why, why deviating, they often do worse than their, than their staff. Um, and it affects not only their stated beliefs in these uh, monetary policy reports, it affects their actual voting behavior. Um, you know, Henry Wallach um, with his 2070 cents might be an uh, outlier, might continue to be an outlier. But generally speaking, if you look at FOMC members who are um, deviating from the proposal of the chairman. So FOMC meeting comes around, the, propo uh, the, the chairperson makes a proposal in terms of what interest set, what Fed funds rate um, we're going for. And then you might either deviate into a dovish direction or into a hawkish direction. And if we see that somebody has had over their lifetime a just 0.1 percentage point higher lifetime experience has been exposed to 0.1 percentage point more inflation, which is roughly a within year standard uh, deviation, you see that the probability of doing a dovish descent goes down by about a third and the probability of a hawkish descent goes up by, by about a quarter. So they, um, as we saw in the previous graph, expect higher inflation to happen, and as a result, think we need to work against that. Uh, rather than worrying about employment, we need to worry more about inflation. So it translates into the decision-making, even of experts. And that's the point where I want to come back um, uh, briefly to this underlying mechanism we think is at work. So this is not, you know, my own research. Um, and this is just my lay neuroscience, cognitive science uh, uh, knowledge uh, in a nutshell, which however I think can be helpful in terms of illustrating uh, what we think is going on here. And um, uh, together with Christina Laudenbach and Alexander niesen runzi we have laid it out a little bit into an, in an AAP and P paper um, last year and have, have another related working paper, um, different context. But um, so the idea here is that what we've learned from neuroscience is that, you know, as we're walking through life and are making experiences, that every time this happens, every time you make a new experience, our brain forms a connection, a connection between two neurons um, which is called a synapse. So there's this, you know, presynaptic neuron which is firing to the postsynaptic and establishing this connection. And these synapses basically, if I can say it that way, tell our body to react, how to react to the world around us, govern the way we experience life. And the brain can do these things, forming synapses, reorganizing pathways, and even creating new neurons, so that's the buzzword of neuroplasticity, in response to learning, experience, and memory foundation all throughout life. We've always known that younger brains tend to be more sensitive, more responsive, have higher plasticity, but we also know now that the brain never stops changing as we are walking through life. In particular, what more kind of recent research, I mean, starting with, um, uh, with a nature and related science paper uh, in the late 90s, uh, 1990s, but also a lot of recent research has been zooming in on, is that how we make an experience and how often we make an experience, how extended the experience is, is important. If we are expo being exposed to repeated stimulation, if we expose in particular these hippocampal neurons, right, this hippocampus here, which looks like the seahorse, um, hippocampus, right, the, the, the monster of the, of the sea. Um, if you um, um, expose it to repeatedly and more strongly, then it can induce some 
this prolongation can increase the synaptic strength and research on so-called long-term potentiation have been pointing out that um, this, um, this strength is then translating into a more immediate connection between, you know, between these, these neurons, a more immediate use of this synapses. So to say it differently, so once we connect a certain type of a thing happening around us to a certain consequence and a certain behavior, this gets more ingrained in us and we are more easily, more quickly going back to that type of connection in our brain. Prior or subsequently learned knowledge, right, rationally, this cannot happen again, that was an outlier, has very limited power in kind of fixing that. And very related to that is the literature on trauma, the synaptic changes caused by, by traumatic stress. And um, you can, I mean, it's a little bit drastic, but you can think, for example, about somebody who has PTSD after uh, fighting in a war and now even in the civil world reacts to, you know, loud car noises if a bomb is happening, uh, is, is ex exploding. And this kind of reaction, which is not help by explaining to this person that the bomb isn't going off, is admittedly somewhat drastically the underlying mechanism we think is at work in experience-based learning. But maybe a pause for a second. I see uh, Rob um, uh, coming in. Uh, there's a question. Yeah. Thank you, Rika. This, this is really fascinating. So it's, it's a really um, uh, related question on the Q&A uh, about can you say a little, a little bit more about why the results um, from experience-based learning cannot be rationalized by models of over-extrapolation? And do you think that, um, you know, experiments can help sort of solve that issue of trying to understand is it learning as opposed to extrapolation? Yeah, so let me clarify. I mean, first of all, rationalized by learning models of learning of uh, models of over extrapolation i so so those are not necessarily rational models but in any case models of over extrapolation are not at all in conflict with what i'm saying here so indeed um you know i didn't put in the graphs of how you weigh the path but say typical models of over extrapolation say we put extra weight on what happened I mean, depending on your experiment in recent days, recent months, or like in finance models over the last year or the last two years, maybe, and so on. So this is definitely there. But then there's something in addition is what I'm trying to say. And in addition, we do see that all the things you have experienced during a lifetime so far can have a lasting impact. It's not just the last two or three, three, three years. So, so far you can think about it as just, okay, it's still over extrapolation. I'm just extending it over the lifetime. But then there's one additional important implication, which is by pinning it to personal experiences, it implies immediately that um, if you compare two people who have different ages, the say 60 year old person will take into account the last 60 years. The 30 year old person will only take into account or will only overweigh, if, if you allow the word over for a second, like the last 30 years. As a result, so take you know, the 1980 high inflation, that will still matter to the 60 year old person. It won't enter uh, the, the 30 year old person's um, over extrapolation, if you want to use that word. And as a result, we generate cross sectional differences. And moreover, we generate that these cross-sectional differences can vary over time. It's not that the young are always more pessimistic than the old, no, that it depends on, in a predictable manner, on what they've seen um, over their lifetime, uh, lifetime so far. And a, a third, I mean, a very closely related implication is that even for the same event, right, over-extrapolation models would say, oh, now everybody will be really pessimistic in terms of what can, I mean, in this case, uh, I don't know, a virus uh, pandemic happening again. This is going to feature much higher in everybody's belief system. That might be true. I mean, in this case, it might be true. However, this will be much more strongly the case for the relatively young who have seen nothing but that, right? Like my kids, eight to 12, they think, okay, this may happen every 10 years now, right? So in their thinking, while I'm still like assigning a much less weight to it. It can also be the other way around. Like if, you know, it can be that the, the beliefs of the older generation is shifted more if it was more consistent with what the young have seen over their lives so far. So to summarize, I didn't mean to contrast it um, as like oh, over extrapolation models are useless. No, no. In fact, if you take like the average behavior, you get something very nicely fitting many over extrapolation models. But I think we can do better um, take into account longer periods and do so differently for different generations. And for, depending on what variables you're interested in, 
this can be quite powerful. So for example, I mean, I do a lot of finance. So in borrowing lending, the older generation often provides the liquidity to the market. The younger ones are borrowing. If they have exactly the wrong beliefs at that point about future interest rate, that really messes up markets. All right. Thank you, Enrique. And just quickly um, follow up based on like the last panel that we had on gender discrimination and field experiments. Could you relate this to discrimination and like, how is this discrimination compared to inflation experiences and economic crisis experiences? Okay, so I, I saw that there was this panel just before and, and in fact I folded in a slide on gender differences in the belief and how it relates to these experience exposure effects. So maybe I don't have many more slides. I'm, I'm aware that I'm supposed to shut down in about three to five minutes, but maybe let me go to that slide and I'm super happy to come back to the gender uh, uh, discrimination aspect. Um, so as a, actually, in fact, as a... Um, transition um, to, towards that topic, I do want to emphasize that, you know, while at least in my own work, in my own early uh, work, I was often using these big shocks that have happened. Great Depression, financial crisis, housing crisis, etc., cetera, um, or, or big inflation spike uh, in the 1970s, 1980s as kind of my motivating um, examples um, to think about how this is, you know, um, uh, scarred or, or, or left lasting impact on certain generations, I do want to uh, emphasize that, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be this big traumatic event. Um, in fact, uh, psychologists often and psychiatrists often talk about trauma with a big T versus trauma with a small T. So, you know, German hyperinflation, Great Depression, we can think about that as trauma with a big T. Um, for the pandemic, you know, like uh, how big the T is might depend on future actions governments are able to take. Um, but then there's also, you know, the daily exposure, the daily little paper cuts um, you get um, depending, you know, for example, due to differential treatment by gender, by race. Um, um, uh, adverse experiences in childhood um, can be quite dramatic, but it can also be s small aspects of differently treating your son versus your daughter, etc. Um, or like back to my inflation or having enough money kind of financial aspects, daily worry about food, about possible future unemployment, even if there wasn't the big shock, um, can last have a lasting impact from the neuropsychological perspective, but also then in our economic data. So let me try to kind of conclude with that and talk about, um, you know, I, if I may use the example still of inflation fears and inflation beliefs to kind of try and dig a little bit deeper and ask, when we ask people, oh, what do you think will happen to prices over the next year? What are they actually thinking about? What comes to their mind? And so together with um, Michael Weber and Francesco da Cunto and um, Juan Ospina, we, um, we have a, a paper about, um, where inflation beliefs comes from. And the aspect I want to emphasize here is we asked a question where we gave people the options to either refer to, you know, news type outlets, TV, radio, newspaper, online news, social media, to refer to what other people say, colleagues, financial advisors, family and friends, or to prices they see while doing their own shopping. And it has been hugely impressive to us how powerful all own shopping is. In particular, you know, people then point out very often grocery items like beer, milk, butter, those prices come to mind. And um, it's kind of interesting to see more so for women than for men, but also for men, the one grocery item that comes more to the minds of men is beer and beer prices, apparently, um, but also, also gas. So that's one thing. So basically, the price signals we see around us in our daily life it's just automatically what comes to mind when we ask about inflation. And then if we go and look at individual people's um, bundles of goods they spend money on in their daily life, so using the Kiels Nielsen um, co consumption data, we kind of construct a household CPI of money they spend on groceries, and then look how these items increase in prices. A lot of it driven just by kind of um, local differences. This is not driven by poor versus rich. Don't have time to go into that. But I just put people into eight bins of, of, of families which have experienced relatively little increase in their grocery prices and those in the eighth one have exp in, in, uh, experienced a lot. And I relate that to their beliefs about inflation, their worries about price increases, et cetera. You see 
that this is strongly positively correlated. And the difference is actually economically significant. So, you know, we have a 2% inflation target. Inflation tends to be below these days. This is data from, I mean, using data going back to 13, 14, 14, 15, with surveys fielded in 16, um, that, that ask people about inflation. And, and so during that time period, if I personally experience more inflation in my butter, milk, whatever prices, I expect 0.5 percentage point higher inflation. Importantly, that holds within household. So you can forget about these other factors you may have in mind. So that's interesting to see. These, they, they put people in a certain environment where they see certain prices. This will just go really deep in terms of their thinking about the world, thinking about aggregate US-wide inflation. Now finally getting to the kind of gender differences aspect. One stylized fact that had been known apparently for a while to people working in the Fed is that there's this systematic differences in beliefs about inflation in that women tend to be more pessimistic than men. So here, I mean, those averages are both too high, but um, it's 4% and like 7%. You see women in like recent data express significantly higher beliefs about future inflation than men. And this is actually the first evidence that exists that says this is true even within households. So take the male head of household and the female head of household, that's the difference you get. Well, now let's zoom in and let's try to get a handle on what prices the man and the woman sees in their daily life. Um, so um, here on the, on, the, on the left is kind of this gender difference after a bunch of controls, it's still around 0.5 percentage points. But now I'm gonna split the sample. So what Francesco, Michael Weber and I do in this gender roles and gender expectations gap paper is we split the sample into a household where on, on the left here of this second right, right side graph, the man is not doing any grocery shopping. And then on the very right, the households where the man is doing at least some grocery shopping. What you can see here is that the difference in female to male beliefs about price changes disappears in households where both are equally participating in the household grocery chores. It's in the households where the woman is doing kind of like in a traditional household or the grocery shopping that you have, you know, even higher differences in beliefs. And, um, you know, in the paper, we go into some more of the underlying mechanism and um, we all know that um, grocery and food beverage prices are highly volatile, so, so much so that they're, often, that they're taken out of the core CPI because they mess up the whole inflation trend. And we also know that individuals tend to remember the, the increases and not so much the decreases. So as a result, if you see a lot of volatile prices, you remember a bunch of increases and tend to get upwards biased beliefs. And so what we are saying here is, you know, in addition to discrimination and gender differences driven by true barriers, you know, in STEM fields, in, in certain professions, etc. In addition to differences driven by what other people believe about you and the barriers they impose on you, there's an, one more aspect we should be worrying about. And that is the environment we put men versus women in. If we have a traditional split up of tasks, which makes the woman do all the grocery shopping, and the husband takes care, or the man in a heterosexual couple takes care of the mortgages and the financial decision making, they will see different price signals and they will come out holding different beliefs and therefore making different consumption, savings decisions, probably job choices, et cetera. And um, this, in, in fact, in, in these regressions here, which are underlying these graphs, the whole gender difference disappears when we just control for grocery, uh, grocery shopping, which is about 25% of the spending um, of these households. So to sum up, uh, slightly over my time here, but I hope the question gave me an additional few minutes. Um, what I wanted to convey here is that um, this research agenda on, expo on the role of exp lifelong exposures and experiences tries to convey that these daily signals we see in our life and their lifetime aggregation have a significant long-term impact in all areas of our economic decision-making. I mostly focused on beliefs about inflation, but there's stock market beliefs, there's consumption expenditure, there's beliefs about um, economic um, uh, development. Um, there are many different markets this has been applied to right now. And um, what plays a role is not only the big T trauma, like the fact that macro shocks have a significant impact, uh, even if pre-crisis conditions are re-established, we are totally in the ceteris paralysis world, we are back to before. No, even then we are altered by having lived through this shock. 
the logic also applies to the small t trauma being placed in a daily environment, being at home versus at a job, grocery price versus other prices that will alter us in the long run in terms of our beliefs and choices. These effects have been documented even among experts. I talked here about FOMC members. We have related projects on the decision making on U at UCSF physicians, um, on, um, on bankers in a project on institutional memory. So, so what that leads me to say is it's not a question of intelligence, of education. I mean, of course, this, these are important factors. It's a question of rewiring. And my personal wish list would be that we are better going to be better leveraging data on lifetime experiences and um, exploit more the potential of the within individual big data to make better predictions about future choices. And I'll stop it here. Thank you, Rike. That was uh, fascinating and really um, interesting for the audience based on all the Q&A questions that we have. Um, I'll just sort of, sort of summarize uh, sort of two or three of them because there's sort of similar questions coming up from from the, from the paper, I'm sorry, from the um, presentation. So, um, Sophia Rakin suggests, you know, this sort of strong relationship between personal experiences and the expectations that they have about these macro variables, is that sort of moderated by time and risk preferences and, and trust, et cetera. And then Mark Ottini uh, Williams suggests that, can you say a little bit more about how emotions or the role of emotions uh, sort of mediate these experience effects. So both these questions are, are trying to get at like, what was like, are there additional mediators? And it'd be great to get your thoughts um, on how do you think about like heterogeneity analysis in this in this case? Because obviously you're trying to get identification um, over time in terms of the exposure, but then how do we think about then the causal impact of a third variable on top of that? Yes. Um, okay. So uh, really, really good questions and exactly getting at the core of what I'm actually personally uh, interested uh, in right now. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, let me just say as a, as a kind of a, like a, a small robustness type answer to some aspects of the first question asking about risk preferences, trust, etc. that in many of um, the papers we've been able to collect traditional measures of um, of risk preferences, so ask people about their risk preference, measure them um, in terms of trust, their different trust measures, and we've employ employed several of them. And then kind of one first approach was just to say, okay, let's control for them. And then is there still a lifetime experience effect? The answer is yes. And it's, 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 it's um, strongly significantly there with the coefficient a little altered. But really the first um, um, uh, uh, question and, and then also the second was kind of asking in terms of channels or mediators, at least that's kind of how you post it. And I think this is very, uh, very uh, relevant and interesting. Specifically, the aspect that came up in the second question, emotions, is something I've been personally super interested in. Um, so one thing I learned from the neuroscience literature was simply the fact that if we live through experiences um, with stronger emotions, whether positive or negative, they get more strongly ingrained. So for starters, I wish I had this um, perfect experiment when I can expose these two twin people to the same experience and kind of trigger stronger emotion in one than the other. And of course, I know about um, ex cool experiments that have been done with inducing fear and kind of trying to relate this to risk in decision making. And so something along those lines, kind of showing that even these longer lasting effects are modulated by the emotions we had at that point in time, I think would be really cool. On the non-experimental side, I've kind of tried to do that. So it's a it's a little bit of a different um, um, application. It's in a paper where, um, where I'm trying to ask um, whether why East Germans compared to West Germans are still so much anti-stock market, anti-capital market, et cetera, which is often very much to their detriment in terms of how they're saving for retirement and the wealth they're accumulating. And um, I've been looking at um, East Germans who had a particularly great experience in the US. So they lived in these showcase cities where there are a lot of celebrations after, say, Chemnitz was renamed into Karl Marx Stadt and was kind of the showcase city. Um, good stuff was happening to them. Um, and I find that these people are indeed still like strong, they really inhibit, in, in, have ingrained in them now the anti uh, capitalism 
I don't know, attitude and are very much shying away from the stock market. People instead had pretty bad experience. So some, sometimes for really nicely identified reasons, I mean, sad reasons, like, like for example, air pollution was terrible in East Germany and in particular in different areas, depending on how the wind was and where the hills were, et cetera. And the people who were most strongly exposed, all their kids had childhood asthma, they embrace we are in Western capital markets investing in the stock market today. Then the other aspects you can look at, for example, particularly religious areas who didn't like the suppression of the religious activities particularly much, they also embrace kind of, and it doesn't depend, Catholics, Protestants, they're embracing markets uh, much more. And you can actually also ask surveys, we're trying to ask them whether there was something good about East Germany and the communist um, uh, regime, et cetera. The guys who are positive have positive memories, with them, also the rest of the message, I'm anti, like capital markets are evil, they're only good for a few rich uh, elites, etc. cetera, is, is still very much there. So much more indirect, of course, then you guys can do it in wonderful experiments, but at least about, you know, three, four decades now, like this long-term exposure, you know, depending on whether the SO2 was blowing into your village or not blowing into your village and your kid had more childhood asthma or not, we see this like predicting whether you're still like, Pro, uh, like an anti-communist um, concept form of government or, or, or pro. And so I would say that strongly hints at this positive versus a negative emotion uh, mediator um, you're suggesting. Um, sorry, there was, I forget now the last aspect. What was the last aspect it, again? It was, it was the emotions. It was the emotions. Ah, okay. So, okay. So, so, so which I just covered is what you're saying or? The emotional aspect, or was there something else? I feel like something I haven't covered yet in your in your question. Sorry about that. I think it was just like do, you know, do do emotions like regulate the experience um, effect on these expectations? Yeah, exactly. And so just to kind of say one more sentence about that. So the, if you read my paper about East West Germany, um, you see emotions, and in fact. Um, a variant of the synaptic tagging hypothesis. So neuroscientists talk about emotional tagging because they think it's so important that you felt strong emotions at the time in terms of how things are anchored in your memory. You see that spelled out. But of course, what we would be hoping for is A, even if it's field data, maybe get a clearer experiment. So say take even, you know, I do a lot of finance, uh, the stock market crash. If you are shorting the market at that point, maybe you have much more positive emotions than everybody else, and you can kind of come out differently. Can we find a setting where we can control for stuff like wealth and so on, and like get at like positive versus negative versus maybe no emotion, and show there's a different long-term effect? And then, of course, if some of this could be done in a, in a lab, RCT-type setting, that would be really the clean thing we're all looking for to prove the emotional point. But the neuroscience, cognitive science, basis is there so you, you you have to be right with your hypothesis we just need to fully show it so. got it thank you Rico. um the, the last keynote that we had in this conference was by larry katz and he was given quite convincing evidence about the move into opportunity programs not just in the us but in in many different type of like voucher programs throughout uh, many countries is you know the, the benefits of moving to a, a, a better neighborhood, a crew for those probably below the ages of seven and eight. As it gets, as the children get older, it gets more disruptive. So I want to tie it a little bit to, to your talk. And this is a question by Julia, which is like, how do you how do you weigh past experiences? How do you, how do you measure it? And do the more recent years count, or do the years of youth count? Because clearly, in the case of moving to opportunity. Like when you're a teenager, forming friendships, it's most disruptive and it doesn't really have an effect. But when you're young and you're kind of like not really forming those uh, to a, a mature extent, you're, ha you know, you, you're better off in that new neighborhood. So could you give us the extent to like how is exposure actually measured? Yeah, yeah, excellent question as well. Um, so there are two aspects I can um, speak to. One is, um, you know, almost like one step before is the question, what do we actually measure? What kind of experience is pretty broad, right? There are many aspects of experience, like in this example right now, your friendship, the opportunities around you, um, frictions, how long does it take you to get to school, et cetera, et cetera. And um, one aspect I'd like to emphasize is that while I don't always know 
what is the most relevant experience, what I, I, I sometimes know, right? Like if I look at stock market investment, well, stock market experiences seem to be the natural candidate, bond market investment, bond market experiences, and um, even some more complicated ones. So for example, consumption spending, how cautious or or how splurgy am I in my spending? I relate that to past uh, difficult times I've personally lived through. Um, you know, sometimes it's pretty um, obvious. Sometimes it's, it's a little harder. But what is important is to make a distinction. So in economics, you know, we often have this, I mean, we typically have this kind of global model of preferences. And, and in some sense also belief formation. So we may be Bayesian, we may be overconfident and so on, but we think about it as a kind of global trait, I mean, at least with, within a person. So, so let's say risk aversion. If I'm risk averse, I'm risk averse in my financial investment, in you know, how risky a sports I do, uh, in, you know, in all sorts of other um, risk-related behavior. And psychologists have been very adamant for a while that this is, that doesn't make any sense. Um, people like, for example, uh, Elke Weber at Princeton University have been promoting these domain-specific risk preferences. So people like me who are a little conservative in their financial investment, but you know, pretty risk loving in their sports type of, of behavior makes sense. You know, we are not inconsistent with, with like uh, other human behavior because it is completely, um, according to psychologists, um, it is normal and it's important to distinguish between different domains. And I forget, I think there are five or seven they've singled out, but that's one thing I wanted to emphasize and then also say that I find that in our data. So even stuff as close as, you know, take two financial securities, bonds and stocks, of course they're different, but if suppose you've had a really crappy experience in the bond market, does that lead to generally more risk averse investment behavior also in the stock market? No. And same stock market towards bond market, no, there's no cross fertilization. We tested that explicitly, for example, even in such a context. So that's one thing I wanted to emphasize. So first question is, what are the relevant experiences? And let's please take this seriously and not just find some proxy for good or bad experiences. The same way um, as in many, I mean, both experimental and non-experimental literature, we sometimes try and try to proxy for risk attitudes, taking, you know, like, is the entrepreneur particularly risk loving? Let's proxy for the risky sports he does. Well, we, that's not what we should be, should be doing. And the same uh, applies here. Now, once we found the right um, experience to look at, then it is indeed the case that more recent experiences tend to matter more. But as I said earlier on, in all the different data sets my courses and I have looked at, so it's consumption choices and unemployment experiences, stock market investment, stock market experience, mortgage choices, or the decision to buy versus rent a home or fixed rate versus variable rate room, um, home, uh, mortgage, sorry, related to inflation experience or interest rate experiences, uh, bond market experiences, um, and then I have these political experiences and the attitudes towards communism. Um, today, in all of these different um, data sets, it was interesting to see that there's a pretty robust pattern that, as I kind of said, like you, for every person in your data set, take today, take that person's birth year, and then once you found the relevant experiences, take roughly linearly declining weights from today back to the birth year. It's, it's actually a little steeper, to be honest, in most data sets, but you know, linearly declining does a trick. And you get this really high predictive power regarding the attitudes about that outcome variable um, today. Now, what I haven't found is that there's some kind of discontinuity as you go from youth to adult, and, which doesn't mean it's, it's not there. Um, it, it, it is likely just the limitations of the data sets I, I've looked at. So I've looked at it in both directions, both in the direction, um, I think, from the perspective, uh, which, what was her name, Julia, like what was asking about it, namely probably saying that the youth, you know, in impressional childhood years, you're more impressed, it leaves a, a stronger impact. Or the opposite, people have often said when I do some of these financial papers, look, you know, stock market experiences when you're three years old. I mean, even you, Ulrike, you probably didn't read the Wall Street Journal then. And so like, why do you say that should leave an impact on you? And so I, 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 have, I have to admit that I haven't been able to find some kind of discontinuity uh, one way or another. 
It is likely due to data limitation. So uh, uh, several of the studies, not all of them, but several rely on repeated cross-sectional data. So I'm not truly able to follow. And also discontinuities, like when I'm starting a job, when I'm earning my first money, I, I often didn't have. So I would still think that as I'm able to dig out of that neuroscience literature more on when our brain has the highest plasticity and when it's kind of becoming lower, I should be able to find a difference. But so far, you know, just taking your lifetime, applying linearly declining weights has been doing the trick. So that's, you know, scientifically what I can say at this point, even though I'm with you in terms of, you know, what is likely the underlying true model. Got it. Fantastic. And then, and then um, a question related to, to that measurement is, do you think it matters that the experiences are experienced firsthand? Or can this experience happen through stories, media, secondhand, through family? I'm sure we've all had experiences about family, you know, someone losing their job or whatever, and then tell them how bad it is to us. So can you give a sense of like how you can disaggregate those two things? Yeah, yeah, great question as well. So, um, you know, the word experience and, and the way I've kind of been talking about it throughout maybe suggests that it should be predominantly um, personal experience. But um, I think sometimes you saw, I mean, you talk about media headlines during the Great Depression and so on. So I'm quite with you that there must be indirect ways um, these, can, can, these experience can affect you. In fact, um, just circling back to the previous question for just a second, the reason why I think, um, you know, a Great Depression during your really early childhood years may have an impact on you is not so much that you worry about the prices of butter and milk increasing on the German hyperinflation or like during the Great Depression, oh, the, the, the job is lost or the salary was furloughed, et cetera. You just see your parents being really worried and tense around you and it's kind of transmitted to you in an indirect way, which is, by the way, also I think what's going on with the Germans, right? The German hyperinflation is quite a while ago, but these stories um, told from our grandparents, our parents to us, somehow powerful enough and vivid enough so that they stay with us. So um, in short, I do think they can be indirect. In fact, a lot of my measures have been indirect. So for example, when we've looked at stock market experiences, I just look at how the S&P 500 did during our lifetime so far. I don't look at your individual portfolio. Sometimes I do that, to be honest, because of data limitations, but also it avoids certain indigeneity concerns, whether I'm smart enough or not to invest in the broadly uh, diversified way in, in the stock market. And that works quite well. Now, in some data sets, I've been able to contrast both. So, for example, in the paper on scarce consumption, where Leslie Shen and I relate um, how cautious a spender or how much of a splurge person you are, how we relate that to your lifetime experience of unemployment. We looked at both your personal unemployment, of course, controlling for your job and job prospects and wealth today, et cetera, but also at the local unemployment rates, like where you live, and then the nationwide unemployment rates. Both are significantly predicting your, um, your willingness to spend today and decades later Personal experiences does tend to leave the larger impact, but I've actually been surprised by the magnitude of what you just kind of observe around you. Now that leaves, so, so, so the first answer is yes, it can come through stories, through media, through what you observe around you. And then the, the, the really interesting question is, what makes it happen that a story becomes so important to you that it becomes ingrained in you, right? Why are the Germans so worried about the inflation in 1923? What, what, what was it? And so I, I, I'm, I've been trying to think about that, actually. And very similar to how the question was asked, can I measure how vivid the story is in the media, how many stories there are in the media, how, how good the stories were? I feel there is some measure out there I haven't discovered. And again, maybe experiments can help to discover that, which would help us understand this better. And if I can make one more experimental comment on that, um, the flip side, of course, is can we undo some of this, right? So I've been telling you, oh, learned information doesn't help. You're just gonna be very impressed by what you live through and that will have a lasting impact. Well, in circumstances where that leads to, you know, a wrong decision, a clearly distorted belief, like you're not, you're, 
25 year old, you're like starting to earn more money in your job and you're not investing in the stock market at all. Even though, you know, I think behavioral or new classical, we would all agree broadly diversified investment might be a good idea at this point. Can I fix it? Can I fix it that this is just happening because you just lived through the financial crisis and are really scared and scarred about it? I feel something along the lines of kind of played experiences like simulation, scenario development and so on could be a way to fix it. And um, there is some uh, data from uh, former Berkeley students uh, in, in, in China on, on insurances that points that in that direction. And so, but now I need to figure out how do I need to tell the story? How do I need to make the experience so that it leaves an impact? So really great questions. The answer is yes on some, you know, non-direct ways to, to, to make experiences and fix experiences, but I don't know how yet. I am, you know, I'm totally desiring to find out the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Rike. Uh, and then one last question, because I think I've, I've seen this a few times is um so obviously a lot of the audience here are, are young they're all doing experiments interesting behavioral too is you know where do you see the um experience agenda go into the future like what are the like, really interesting open questions in the literature right now and you know what field experiments would you like to see people do to actually help address that literature yeah so um well so in terms of the agenda in general, I do think that um, this notion that um, you know, experiences, experiences we've collected throughout our lives, stuff we have been exposed to through our lives, is a really strong determinant of our beliefs and our attitudes uh, for, for some time going forward. Um, applies, I mean, I believe it applies to everything, to every experience, to every decision we are making so far. And I'm very keen to kind of see it applied to important realms. So for example, one aspect I've been thinking about is um, climate. Um, so um, what, what triggers, what kind of personal experience, personal exposure will trigger people to turn around and become more active in terms of, you know, helping um, to, to protect the environment, help with, with, with climate change, for example. Um, we can think about uh, the long lasting effects of um, ACEs, uh, adverse childhood experiences. We can think about uh, racism and how the long term exposure to, you know, not only the big T trauma, but the small paper cuts, as I said before, alter you and how we have to take that into account when evaluating um, the, the achievement of different people. So that's in the, maybe in the um, education uh, realm as well. That would be a second um, important area where I would love to see people kind of apply these concepts. Uh, in terms of experiments, um, I, I almost have a question back for you guys because I've been fascinated by how parallel our findings are to what people have found in the lab in much over much shorter horizons. So for example, camera and hose, like experience weighted learning models and econometrica and whatnot, like where you see people like in certain environments making certain decisions that are optimal, then you change the environment, but they kind of keep sti sticking to the decisions that work, work then. That's totally parallel to what I see in the long run. So I kind of wish I could already jump to the conclusion that this is parallel. I do think some of the synaptic tagging and other neuroscience suggests it could be parallel. It could be the same underlying effect. So, but once we've figured that out, then we can get at what maybe two questions ago, a, a couple of, of people were asking, what modulates experiences? Like how can we interact them with emotions? How we can, how can we help people who have had bad experience to overcome the long lasting effect? And I think that's absolutely what we need um, experiments for. Awesome. Thank you, Enrique. Um, on behalf of um, everyone here, uh, I think we can all say that was a great experience for ourselves <laughs> and going through uh, your talk. So thank you for uh, giving your generous time um, today in, in going through your research agenda. It's really fascinating. I'm sure we'll see some field experiments in this area very, very soon as well. So, so thank you. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Eureka's talk um, uh, concludes the, the field experiment conference for this year. Um, John had to dash away to an urgent uh, work call, so you might not be able to join these closing remarks, but uh, on behalf of John and myself, thank you all for, for taking part. Um, if you were... Uh,
in the audience asking questions, if you're just part of the audience listening, if you're a presenter, um, in terms of the virtual presentations, thank you so much for doing that. We've got like a rich database now of, uh, you know, over 85 five minute talks, which are, which are fantastic. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll all learn from them. So, so thank you very much. For those who are on the panel, thank you for, for taking part as well. Really great having those three panels um, with all those young researchers at the cutting edge doing uh, field experiments in this area, so thank you. And then thank you to the, the, the three keynotes, Ariana, Larry, and Anurike, thank you so much. And then to all myself, I'd like to, like to thank uh, Jamie and Jimmy Phillips and Dana Smith for helping to organize this thing. Um, they're the ones who do all the work in the background, not us. So uh, thank you to, to both of you for, for helping so much in, in getting this, exper getting this uh, failed experiment conference implemented and completed successfully. So thank you both. And thank you to Sarah and to EOS for, for managing the the virtual presentations can always sometimes go away, but we had no hiccups this year. So that was very, very good. So um, thank you very much to the team in the background at U Chicago in, in helping out. So I think that concludes uh, this year's conference. I think next year, um, hopefully we can do it in person. We much prefer that. Um, uh, we don't know where it'll be, whether it be in California in LA or in Chicago next year, we'll probably decide a bit closer to the date, but um, I hope you all stay well and healthy um, for the rest of the year and very much looking forward to, to seeing you all uh, in 2021. So um, that concludes the conference and thank you all for your participation and see you all very soon. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Take care.